Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Mom Hour. I am Sarah Powers, here with an interview to kick off your weekend. So as many of you know, we try to bring you at least one conversation each month with someone from outside of Megan and my usual banter. And these Voices episodes are really a chance for us to get to talk to some incredible people in the parenting space and even beyond. Today, I am talking with Megan Leahy, who is a parenting coach and a writer I have been following for years. She's a columnist for The Washington Post, which is where I first came across her work, I think. But it was actually her social media posts that brought me so much value during the little years, especially. She's a bit sarcastic and brutally honest, which is a style I have always been drawn to since the very beginning of my consuming parenting writers. And she has three kids, each of whom are a little bit older than mine. So when I was reading her, her stories were both relatable to my world and then also kind of a peek of what's to come. Megan has a new book out this year, which we will talk about, and it's all about kind of combating that perfectionist parenting culture that is so tricky nowadays. Uh, She also continues to work with parents virtually through private coaching and group classes and live chats, all kinds of stuff. Today, Megan and I talk about the pressure that parents feel in our modern society and why it just was not meant to be that way. We also talk about how she coaches parents to think about some of the most common power struggles The ones we hear about all the time in our community, things like tantrums, meltdowns, inflexibility, negativity, things like fostering independence while, you know, maintaining some boundaries in your home. I think what I love most about this conversation is that Megan doesn't promise easy fix it answers. She actually reminded me that this all is not supposed to be linear or easy. It's a really good reminder that just because it feels hard, that doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. So a couple of things I wanted to mention about this conversation you're going to hear, and then we will dive in. Um, First, Megan speaks very frankly about how the pandemic has affected tweens and teens mental health. And in doing that, she touches on some pretty sensitive subjects that might bring up questions if you have some curious little ones who listen along with you. You know, this podcast is always technically clean from a language standpoint, but I always like to let you know when the subject matter might veer into a little more serious or mature topic areas. And then also, Megan makes a great point later in the episode when we talk about child development, that you are the best expert on your kid. And I wanted to just stress that point again, because anytime we do an episode where the message is like, this is really normal, this is age appropriate, um, adjust your expectations and just trust that it's all going to resolve itself, it's all going to be okay, this won't last forever, yada, yada, yada. There's a flip side to that, which is that if you do have questions about neurotypical development and your kid, you should absolutely look into that. You should talk to your pediatrician, get to the bottom of what's going on. I believe that. Megan Leahy believes that. Megan Francis believes that. So on this show, we want to encourage you to listen to your gut and then also reassure you that in many cases, this very typical age appropriate behavior has a way of like freaking moms out and convincing them something else is going on. And that may or may not be true. So just wanted to underscore that. Okay, I'm so glad you're here today, friends. So glad you're listening. Let's dive into my conversation with Megan Leahy. Hi, Megan. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Thanks so much for being here with me today. Thanks so much for having me. It's my pleasure. So would you please tell our listeners just a little bit about you and your family and the work that you do with parents? Oi. I mean, how far back do you want to go? Um, I came to D.C. um, right out of high school for college, and I was a secondary ed English major. I I didn't really know what I wanted to be. I didn't really want to be anything, um, but I became a teacher. (laughs) Okay. Which is, you know, I come from a line of teachers, so it was kind of in my blood. And I love to read. So I was like, hmm, that's good. Um, And I was teaching for a number of years in an all boys school. And, um, I realized that the boys, I was a pretty mediocre teacher. Um, (laughs) I love to like talk about literature and everything, but I was like, we don't need grades. We don't need assignments. (laughs) Um, and I found that the kids were coming to me asking me very personal questions. Like, Uh should I have sex with my girlfriend? And, um, you know, like, 
my parents scream and fight all the time. And I'm like, uh, you're not old enough to even like go have an allowance to buy condoms. So let's talk about that. And um, mm-hmm. I, I wasn't legally allowed to talk to them. Mm. So I decided to go to Hopkins for a counseling degree. Um, and as soon as I made that decision, I got pregnant with my first. Um, I got I got married. Actually, I have my 20 year anniversary next month. Oh, congrats. Yeah, thanks. And um, and I got pregnant and it took me a number of years to get through that program. I kept having babies. I only have three. I make myself sound like a dugger or something. I only have three. But I came out of that degree, A, realizing how hard parenting was because now I was a parent. Mm -hmm. And B, not wanting to be a school counselor at all. Mm -hmm. Um, So I hear I had this expensive, lengthy degree. Right. Teaching experience. And I didn't really know um, what I was doing. And so I started taking parenting classes for myself. Mm -hmm. And then I started working for the organization Volunteering for Free. Okay. And then uh, right after I had my third, like three, she was three weeks old, I got certified as a parent coach. Okay. And started my business. I borrowed a bunch of money from my husband and... That was 11 and a half years ago. Yeah, I was going to jump in and ask the ages of your girls because I I have followed you myself just as a parent and a reader for a long time. And I always um, appreciated just coincidentally, we both have three kids and yours are just a bit ahead of mine. So tell everybody the ages of your of your kids currently. Uh, 17, 14 and 11. OK, and mine are 13, 11 and almost nine. So I'm just a few years a few years behind you. And that was one of the things I really appreciated, um, you know, several years ago when I was reading your Washington Post articles and your Facebook posts is just that that three kid perspective um, is nice to share with somebody. So you are firmly in the teen years now, I guess, with a yes, with a tween bringing up the rear. Yes, we are very, very much in it. And um, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I love that. I love hearing that. And our listeners will love hearing that. Um, so, so your parenting coaching business for the last more than a decade, Mm -hmm. um, maybe just talk a little bit about what that looks like day to day. I, I know you have online classes. Do you take private clients? Has that changed over the years, how you work with parents? Oh, that's such a good question. So it started as an all out coaching hustle. And, um, I, yes, I still, see one-on-one clients that it it has changed how it looks over the years it was like just one-on-one um in person then I was like oh my god that's like therapy (laughs) like I don't want these couples fighting in front of me so now it's all I've always been zoom okay yeah or or I started skype you know old school um it was phone it was one-offs it was six packages it was succession packages six month packages meow 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 and then I started an online class, I don't know, five or six years ago. Okay. And that's for the ones of parents of kids like mm, nine and under. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's had also many iterations, group work, totally evergreen, Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Um, Yeah. I used to talk a lot in schools. Okay. Um, Not so much. Yeah. Um, and not so much even before pandemic. Yeah. It sounds like you've been able to kind of, um, evolve the business as your own kids have gotten older and probably as your own time has expanded and contracted. We talk a lot about that, um, on, on this show, the different, the, the different bandwidth I'm sure that you had over the years raising three kids of your own. So that's, that's great. Um, I just want to share on a personal note that what I have always appreciated about your tone in your articles and your social media posts um, is that you seem to strike a balance between really acknowledging the importance of a parent's mental health and wellness. Meaning this is not, you're not encouraging parents to give every last drop of what they've got in service to kids growing up, you know, healthy and well-rounded and 
all the things, right? At the same time, I think you do a really good job of educating parents on on developmentally what's going on with kids, what kids might need from their caregivers. And I think that creates attention. It just does. Because let's say like in the example of like a a three-year-old who's defiant and yelling and pushing boundaries, there are developmentally things that that three-year-old needs from us, patience and validation of big feelings and all that. And you have parents stretched really thin, especially the last couple of years. So I would just love to kind of wherever you want to jump in, maybe tell me if I'm on base here that there is a natural tension there between, and I'm going to speak mostly about moms here, moms getting time for themselves, holding their own boundaries, protecting their own mental health, and the tension between giving our kids that emotional support that they need. Does that feel like attention to you, I guess? And if so, um, how does that work its way into your work? Mm, God. Yeah, it's such a mess. Um, (laughs) It really, it's such a mess. It's so we have a culture, a parenting culture obsessed with doing, Mm. right? It's baked into our American um, identity. Um, we are a country of people who left other countries for independence. Mm -hmm. It's like part of our DNA, unless we dragged people here and made them build our country and then say we built it. Um, but we, we have this bootstrapping way. Mm -hmm. And so the answer always has to be, what do I do? Right. The the question I mean, right. That is asked is what do I do? And so the place that I find that I'm always coaching and trying to write about is how can I be, Mm. right? So in very old parenting cultures around the world, you will see a natural way that the parents are. It is more of a stance Mm. and a way of being than a prescribed doing. Mm. I love that. So. Um, I believe that's still in us. It's just so overwhelmed with tips and tricks and strategies and diagnoses. And like it, we're just in a frantic, um, panicked place Mm -hmm. of what to do next, what to do next, what to do next. Um, and that we forget that (laughs) there's often not a lot we can do. Yeah. (laughs) Like, um, and so there is, because we believe we need to be doing something and because especially mothers have taken on like, go to the workforce, be amazing. Oh, and by the way, do all the stuff you always had to do for time eternal. The doing culture is crushing us Mm -hmm. spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, physically. And kids start to feel like a project. The parents start to feel like failures Mm. and it it just folds in on itself over and over and over. Um, And there's a lot of power in understanding where your kid is developmentally and just not making things worse. Mm. Oh man. That's like, that's a reframe, isn't it? Just like, just, just almost get out of the way. Like 100%. Yeah. And it's, and, and the, if we can accept that parenting is in essence paradoxical always, Mm. then we can start to relax into it. You know, your kid is born fully who they are, Mm. right? Sperm meets egg in whatever capacity, and there they are. Height, weight, IQ, all their potentiality, right? And so our job is to both let that grow Mm -hmm. and encourage it. Yeah. Right. And that's a paradox. Right. Right. Those are two opposing forces ex- existing in our same work day to day. And so in that way, it's a dance. Every kid is different. We're doing the cha-cha. They're doing the waltz. Mm-hmm. We're all just fumbling around. But there's really never an answer yeah. for what parents want. Not as clearly as they think. Yeah. It sucks. Um, it does. It does. <laughs> um, but it's, it's really, I think, such such a, a unique position to take or a, a bold statement to make. And I'm thinking of our listeners who have tiny kids still, mm. um, because your, your challenge for moms to think about 
who they want to be or what they want to be or how they want to be rather than the doing, I think is, is so powerful. And I, going back to that kind of, um, mom needing a break and mental health piece, it, it really does inform that at a foundational level, because if as a mom, I want to be whole and healthy, then, then sometimes that's going to mean letting my kid cry for five minutes while I take a break. Um, and so sometimes it is not the the action maybe, but that returning to who I want to be or how I want to be as a mom. I like that it um, brings it back to us a little bit rather than mm-hmm. that action focused um, framework that you described. So I love that. Yeah. Nobody wants to be a project. Right. right. Nobody wants to be con- constantly fixed and, um, changed. And I remember with my first, I, I wasn't a young mom, but in DC, it was like babies having babies. I think I was pregnant at like 26 or 27. And people are like, Oh my God, I'm planned. Or like, are you okay? (laughs) And, um, I was really though, I was really alone. I was really, really alone. All my friends had moved away to New York city post-college. They were like living a fabulous life. And I was in DC and I was married and pregnant and had a kid and I I was alone. And I remember, you know, my daughter just wouldn't eat. Just uh, And, but I remember being in the bathroom and she was in one of those bouncers that I'm sure like kills kids now, but, <laughs> um, and I was putting on makeup and I remember turning to her. I don't know how old she was and being like, If mommy doesn't put on this makeup, I just don't know what will happen today, (laughs) you know, and smiling at her. And that kind of became my ethos that she was well fed. She was changed. She was warm. She was safe. Right. So her share, her needs were met. Yeah. I was there and I was never going to allow my motherhood to stop me from mascara. (laughs) And that's just a metaphor for whatever yeah. else needs to happen, right? So the mother duck, when it's leading the ducks across the street, isn't like, am I a duck? Am I like, <laughs> <laughs> it is moving forward. And one of those little ducklings falls behind. She's like, oh, for the love of Pete, and goes back and brings him <laughs> over, right? And so you see this, and we are animals. We are the highest of the mammals. Yeah. But because we're neurotic, um, we doubt who we are. Mm. We doubt what we are. Mm. And we don't yeah. have to as much. Now, some of us were born into families of origin that did not give us what we needed. Mm-hmm. And we are like speaking another language of attachment and love and confidence. Um, it, it, you know, you were born a duck, but kind of raised a wolf. Right. You're going back to your duckness. Right. 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 Um, and so I never want to say like, oh, well, this is just easy cheesy. I mean, right. some people have to come to this stance, to this confidence mm-hmm. through therapy and tears and hard harder work than others. Right. So people say to me all the time, like I look around and people have it easier. I'm like, yeah, they do. They do. Like you may be watching a mom with less neuroses and an easier kid. Mm -hmm. And so what? Right. Like, so what? Right. That may be like, because everyone wants to say like, oh, everybody has it hard or everybody struggle. And there is no like trauma Olympics. There's no struggle, struggle Olympics. Right. Um, And people have it easier. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Right. You know, absolutely. It's true. Yeah. (laughs) And easier is also a mindset. Yeah. So I don't know. I just felt like I went off on a tangent. No, I love it. I love I love I loved every minute of it. And we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, um, I want to walk through like some big picture developmental stages so we can dive in a little bit to what's happening with our kids when we experience some of the classic you know, the tantrums, the yelling, the defiance and all of that. So we'll be right back. Sarah, there were so many things that we just kind of had to let go of during the pandemic. And I think for many parents, especially those working at home with little kids also at home, 
Screen time limits were just one of those things. When you need to get something done or just need some peace and quiet, a little time with a device can be just the break everyone needs. Oh, yes, that is so true. And we have all been there. But I have noticed that the quality and the type of screen time makes all the difference in kind of alleviating that mom guilt and not making my kids turn into little monsters when screen time is over. If you can relate to that struggle, you're definitely going to want to check out our new sponsor, Pock Pock Playroom. Pock Pock Playroom is an award-winning collection of creative, open-ended toys that spark imagination for kids two to six years old and beyond. It's a digital toy for your iPad or iPhone, but unlike those addictive gaming apps, Pock Pock is inspired by real playroom. There's no winning or losing, and kids can make discoveries at their own pace. Katie on our team let her four-year-old test it out, and she said that one of the best things is the way he's able to explore completely independently. He doesn't get stuck or frustrated because there are no rules. How great is that? Pock Pock is offering Mom Hour listeners 50% off an annual subscription. This is a great deal, and since there are already tons of toys in the playroom and new toys are added all the time, Your kids will always find something new to explore. So another thing I love about Pock Pock Playroom is that kids can play anytime, anywhere without an internet connection. I'm thinking this would be a lifesaver when traveling with kids or like stuck in the pediatrician's waiting room, right? Just go to playpockpock.com slash redeem and use the code MOMHOUR for 50% off an annual subscription. That's code MOMHOUR at playpockpock.com slash redeem for 50% off. That's play, P-O-K, P-O-K dot com slash redeem. And your child can start playing with Pock Pock's creative, calm and sensory friendly toys today. Megan, we did a little in-person show and tell with our beta brand pants a couple of weeks ago. Yours are so cute. You would never know that high-waisted, boot-cut, flattering black trousers were like secret yoga pants. I know. And yours were so different from mine, which is so fun. I loved the bright blue color and the subtle zigzag pattern. Those were some fancy pants, Sarah. (laughs) They were. Well, they're fancy pants that feel like stretchy comfies, which is the magic of Beta Brand. Their dress pant yoga pants are designed with the fit and flexibility of yoga pants, but they look like professional dress pants. They're made of wrinkle-resistant, stretch-knit fabric, so they look good all day. They're perfect for the office, running errands, or even just working from home. Just throw a pair on, add a cute top or your favorite shoes, and you're set with style and comfort all day. Beta Brand also has limited release colors and patterns, and they're constantly coming out with new styles, even tops, skirts, and dresses. And right now, our listeners can get 30% off their Beta Brand order at betabrand.com slash themomhour. That's B-E-T-A-B-R-A-N-D dot com slash themomhour for 30% off your order for a limited time. And when you use our special URL, you're supporting our show too. Discover what it's like to be comfortable and confident all the time. Go to betabrand.com slash the mom hour for 30% off. Okay, Megan, as, as I shared, I was drawn to your work. I probably, when I had three tiny kids or maybe a couple and one on the way. Um, and I, I loved your tone. I loved your ability to bring humor in to, you know, discussions around potty training or tantruming or defiance. Um, But particularly one thing I've always loved is your ability to educate us about what's what's going on typically for a developing kid and almost helping parents right size expectations for behavior. If I could if I could pinpoint one of the things that drew me to your work is that often a through line was, okay, yes, this behavior is frustrating for you as a parent. But guess what? Good news and bad news it's really, it's really normal or typical or whatever word you want to use. And here's why. So I'm hoping that we can, um, kind of share some of that with our audience by going through, we're going to generalize here quite a bit because we don't have six hours, but going through some of the big, big phases of behavior, um, that, that maybe bring challenges to parents and just have you shed light on what's going on for a, a developing kid um, and and what parents maybe what they can expect or or what kind of um, reframe you offer your clients about these behaviors. And I'm going to dive right in with toddlers and just mm. broadly talk about I'm going to say like the young toddlers, especially the 18. My my personal unfavorite phase is 18 to 24 months. I feel like mm, it, so is, tiring. It, it is it is something special. And people are like, what the terrible twos haven't even arrived yet. You know, the new, the new moms who are thinking it was going to happen at two and often it's 12 to 18 months or 18 to 24, but things like 
you know, knowing the meaning of no and absolutely doing the opposite thing and looking right at you, um, melting down over what seems like a small thing. Maybe it was an easygoing baby who's turned into like actually have a personality that includes a lot of no and a lot of crying or whining. So Mm -hmm. let's talk about toddlers and maybe I'll just let I'll just let you loose. What's going on, especially with a young toddler? And when these behaviors throw parents for a loop, what do you tell them? Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, it's such a physically and emotionally exhausting age. Yeah. So, for instance, I have three teens and tweens or whatever in my house, and it is emotionally exhausting, but I'm not chasing them. Right. (laughs) Okay. So you have to remember you're tired. Yeah. You're legit tired, whether you're home with them all day, which is a special kind of torture, yep. or you work all day and then have to parent all night. It, you're tired. Yeah. And I want you to know that you weren't meant to be alone with your kid as much as we are alone with them. Mm. So we were born as, as mammals and we raise our, our littles in groups. And back um, many, many thousands of years ago, you and your sister wives would have been in the cave, you know, yeah. like with your thousands of sisters, cousins, aunties, your mom, your grandmom, your great grandmom, because, yeah. you know, you had babies of 15, yeah. 12. And uh, you all just would have been passing babies around. Yeah. Somebody would have been watching that 18 month old tearing down the block yeah. toward, the, you know, um, the figurative block. So if you're like, I am so sick of this kid, you bet you are. Right. And if you don't have family, that's why we hire our family yeah. or farm out your family. There is some shame around that. Yes. But because we've moved away from all our people for good and bad reasons, um, you hire them as much as you can afford. Mm-hmm. Um, it's good for your kid and it's good for you. Mm. Okay. So the littles, it's a primarily purely emotional stage, which means that their logical brain has not come online. The software is there. It is it is lighting up here and there. But their ability to be logical is largely absent. So that means like waiting. Right. Five minutes could mean five days could mean five months. Right. Um, They are purely for themselves. Yes. In the moment, magical thinking, the attachment rubber band is growing, which means that, you know, first they're kind of on you, then they're now they're venturing forth. And what they'll do is they'll venture forth and then they'll kind of turn around and check, turn around and check. Right. Then a stranger comes along and zoop back to your leg. Mm -hmm. Right. So a healthy child at this age is, you know, with you and venturing forth Mm -hmm. and and wanting to jump off of walls go to the step like this body is an amazing thing that they're realizing they own right and um because they don't have a lot of logic and because they don't have an interior voice that says you know ralph this is not a big deal you can wait right And because they don't have the language to be like, mom, you know, I'm really feeling ambivalent about this hot dog. (laughs) Right. What you get is tantrums. Right. Fighting, kicking, screaming. Mm -hmm. And if you want to torture yourself as a parent, you'll ask the kid why. (laughs) Right. Like the kid's going to pop out and be like, so listen, (laughs) Sarah, you've not changed my diaper. My little rump is itching. Right. They are unable to let their needs come forward in a way that we can understand. Right. So that feeling in us when we've had as adults a really long day and then you open the chicken to cook dinner and it's gone bad and you're like, that's it. Right. Like, yeah, you throw the chicken, you go nuts. Yeah. That's that age all the time. Yes. And then we have some really wrong thinking in our culture, like, let's give them choices. Mm. This is insane. I have so, people hire me 
because they've read too many books and it's crazy. So they, you can't ask a kid too often at this age, do you want the red cup or the blue cup? Mm. For this age, um, they're like, oh, I didn't know I had a choice. Right. Red. Then they see the blue going away. They're like, blue. Yeah. And then they're like, well, is yellow back there? <laughs> and now we're pissed. Right. But everywhere we've read, give them choices. Give them choices. You want to not give too many choices yeah. only because it's not developmentally appropriate. Right. You, the child will let you know when they're ready for choices. You, all you have to do is pay attention. OK, so that is so fascinating, Megan. And I'm going to pause there because we are going to transition to talking about preschoolers. And, you know, I'm going to say like four to six year olds. And I'm so fascinated by this. Like they will let you know, because I'm thinking back of the times when I had like a two, a four and a six year old. And you're right. Like red cup, blue cup is too much for a toddler and yet maybe works really well for a preschooler. And you're saying they will let you know. So again, it's sort of just like this is unfolding as it is designed to do. And we maybe are getting in the way. A hundred percent. And when we're getting in the way, we are learning to become a parent as they are learning to become a human. Yeah. There's no other way but through. Right. Okay. So when parents call me, like, we have a fight every night at bedtime because it is always teeth, bath, books, bed. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm like, okay, that sounds lovely. How old's the kid? Five. Five? That kid's got to have some choices. Right. Right. So what you start doing is at two and three, you start doing this really beautiful routine and it feels safe and it's working. Mm. And then because you've done a good job. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. Independence is sadly happening. <laughs> Your child's like letting you know, and literally will say to you, stop being the boss of me, mm -hmm. which we consider defiance and misbehavior. And I consider beautiful. Right. Because what do you want to do? Raise a robot? <laughs> right? Yeah. And so this is an invitation for us to be like, I actually don't care when you brush your teeth. Right. Like, I, you know, oh, right. I'm, I've been the boss of you. Right. You know what you need to do here. Right. Right. Um, and instead, we create um, consequences. Was just, it's just a euphemism for punishment. Um, and what we don't understand is that, I mean, every kind of night with a child before six is a little bit like hell, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. between the hours of like three and seven, nothing good happens. Right. Right. So you just have to take it as easy as you can. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not great trouble. Yeah. I love yeah. that. Something. I remember I had one preschooler and so I am in the kind of four to five range right now who was incredibly inflexible. Um, mm. And this child is 11 now and I, is such a, it's such a beautiful story of me probably not understanding what was happening and expecting too much too soon. Cause my first, this is my middle child and my first had been pretty easy going. Um, so mm. I would love to talk about this. Uh, four, maybe four to six age range. And what I'm hearing you say is they do start to have independence. They do start to say, you're not the boss of me. Um, mm -hmm. And yet they're not driving themselves to high school yet. They're, they're somewhere in between. Let's talk about uh, what I, what I hear from our audience is kind of like, he should be able to handle this by now. These meltdowns are outsized compared to the infraction. This kid isn't two anymore. Um, and yet I had a four, five and six year old who had incredibly big meltdowns. Are we expecting too much too soon sometimes of emotional regulation from these like preschool and kindergartners? Yeah, a hundred percent. OK, let's talk more about that. Well, and here's a caveat, caveat, caveat. Sure, of course. There are parents who are listening where you are looking at your kid, even somehow through this podcast right now, <laughs> like something is up. And I always want parents, right, because early intervention work on um, all kinds of issues is powerful. Yes. 
right? So if you have an inkling in you, right, go to the people mm -hmm. and talk to people until they believe you. And if you talk to enough people and they're like, no, girl, listen, it is okay, then you call me, okay? <laughs> um, yes. So four to six is a really intense time because what is happening is that prefrontal cortex is coming online which is really also the ability to appreciate somebody else's perspective, mm. okay? And the, uh, the essence of maturity, as Dr. Gordon Neufeld calls it, is holding two opposing thoughts at the same time. Mm. I want the cookie and I need to wait. So the two-year-old is, I want the cookie, I want the cookie, I want the cookie, right? right? The eight-year-old maybe, seven-year-old, eight-year-old maybe, I need to wait, I need to wait, I need to wait. The four to six, flip-flops in and out. Mm -hmm. So you will have days, sometimes even weeks of like, holy crap, this kid is amazing. <laughs> like we're having fun. They're like letting me know. They're... And then you will have a period of growth where they seem to regress and quote unquote become little again. Mm. And you will see inflexibility, meltdowns, which are different from tantrums. Tantrums kind of are like, I want what I want. A meltdown is literally like they can't, they're, they're, you know, um, dysregulated. Yeah. Like outside their body. I've seen correct, some correct, that are correct. truly seem like out of body experiences. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And so you'll, and you'll see sleeping issues and then they seem to come out of it again. And there's a lot of six month marks. Okay. And people will call me during these dysregulation um, periods and be like, <gasps> you know, and I'm like, you know what? Save your money. <laughs> get a sitter, go away. <laughs> you don't need me. Call me in three weeks. Yeah. And inevitably they're like, oh, he came out of it. I'm like, right. Um, because growth is in fact a, both a spontaneous and a gradual process. Oh, that's so true. Right. And it, which is why I can't ever ask you like, what day was it? that your daughter learned to blank, blank, blank. Right. Right. Um, and yet we kind of wake up, turn around and go, oh, they're different. Right. And it's a mystery. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a mystery of nature. Right. Kind of like the seed is always growing and then one day, poof, there's right. the little green. Right. When did right. that happen? Right. It was always happening. Right. Right. It was always happening. So in essence, as a parent, you are looking at a four and six year old having a lot of faith. Yeah. That the software <laughs> is there. Yeah. <laughs> it's coming online. You see glimpses of it. Right. You see empathy, patience, mm -hmm. compassion, and it's not mimicry anymore. Right. It's, it's authentic. That's right. It's coming from within them. And that is so good. And in order to encourage that, right, we keep offering age appropriate independence right on the risk line. Yeah. Yes. Right pushing on that line. And for every kid, that looks a little different. Mm -hmm. If you have a little HSP, a little highly sensitive person, you know, um, they usually look, feel, and sound about two years behind their peers. Mm -hmm. Um, why? Because the brain is so busy defending itself from all this sensory input. Mm -hmm. Takes a little longer to grow. They'll get there. Right. Right. Um, it, but it can take a while. Right. Um, gifted kids. Mm -hmm. Right. They can like talk to you about space at an abnormally young age and also seem to lag socially. Right. Right. So everybody has their way. Right. So. You have to really be careful when you're looking at developmental charts or God forbid, talking to your mother-in-law or your friends. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, you have to make it right for your kid. I mean, so many people call me premature children. R true, true preemies. Yeah. Okay. Who spent a good bit of time in the hospital. You cannot compare them to their peers. Right. Right. The teachers might, the daycare might, your family might, but you cannot. Right. Right. 
So I don't know if I answered your question. Yes, absolutely. And what I, <laughs> no, I, no, you absolutely did. And what I wanted to circle back to with the four to six range is what I'm hearing you say is it's almost like as parents, we see evidence of that software coming online. We see evidence of her sharing with her siblings spontaneously. And then we get so excited that we apply that standard like that, like that personal best. Like if I was like, you know, had a personal best on a running day, I don't run. But like then to hold myself to that standard every day forever, including when I, you know, didn't get sleep last night or had a cold would be totally unfair. So what I'm hearing you say is it's almost like because they are developing, but it's gradual, we, we paint ourselves into a corner by expecting their, uh, their, their utmost all the time when instead we should be expecting that vacillation that you've described. Yes. And hungry, sick, or tired takes everyone offline. Right. Right. And that's like, I don't know, 80% of a kid. Yes. Hungry, sick, or tired. Yeah. Right. And a lot of times, you know, they, they sprout the fever and go down and you're like, oh, right. This explains oh, so much. <laughs> right. That's why grandma's was such a disaster. Right. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I used to drop off my kids to school and be like, I hope you have a meh day. And they'd be like, <laughs> thumbs up. Right. Like, we're not going for A plus. Right. The A plus life is not, I don't even, B plus life. I mean, yeah. C's used to be like the middle way. Right. And I'm like, I want you to really just dial it in. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Let's just have kind of like some regular expectations. Regular expectations. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, actually that, that relates to what I wanted to talk to you about when it comes to elementary school kids. And now I am, um, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, ten. in a lot of families. This is kind of like Megan, my co-host Megan, who's normally with me, she calls it the gravy years. Cause often things are kind of ticking along. We haven't hit pre-puberty yet, but something that comes up in our audience a lot with I'd like say seven to 10 year olds, two things, anxiety and chronic negativity, which in my experience are sometimes related. I realize you and I could probably talk for an hour and a half on, on these two things, but I wonder if a parent came to you and said, you know, Megan, my eight year old's doing fine in school. Like there's no, we, that we've ruled out any kind of, um, neurodevelopmental stuff, but she's just negative about everything, or she's still you know, hanging on to these childhood anxieties. Are the are are these common in parents of that age range for you? And and what's the first thing you ask or say? Yes, it is common. And I also just want to caveat it with the pandemic has exacerbated this tenfold. Right. And um we have yet to see the mental health outcomes of this. Right. Because right. we're in it. Um, I've never coached more parents than I've coached in the last 18 months. I have never seen this level of anxiety, depression, uh, suicidal ideation, cutting, uh, eating disorders. I mean, really, really bad stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, again, nobody calls me because things are great. I just, you know, kids that were doing pretty well. Right. And then. Right. Right. Now, the eight-year-old is high, becoming highly aware of their peers and where they fit in and where they don't. And these years used to be the gravy years, but because of social media mm. and technology, you are seeing early tween stuff, mm-hmm. right? So everything is fall inching down, inching down. And what is happening is our eight and nine and 10 year olds are on TikTok and they start to become um, highly aware of others' approval or unapproval and they don't have the maturity to handle it. Yeah. So they're having kind of like little existential addictive crises. Okay. Say, so what do you mean by existential addictive crises? Why well, addictive? because uh, social media is addictive. Okay. Right. So anything where you get a like or a response or a watch Mm -hmm. taps into the reward center of our brains where we love all the good stuff. Right. Cocaine, (laughs) booze, chocolate. Okay, this isn't like meditation, waiting. Right. (laughs) Right. Right. It's all the fast hits. Right. Right. And so when you do that to a child or when a child does it to themselves and we allow it for all kinds of good and bad reasons, 
um, they don't have a strong voice within them. Like, whoa, this has gone too far. Right. Or my fellow peers are making bad decisions. <laughs> or how do I really feel about my self-esteem within right. this model? Right. Um, that voice hasn't matured. Yeah. And so they begin to really develop very strong sense of self-consciousness and it's their the tween years are so narcissistic that um they actually are very close to a two-year-old again uh -huh. in a similar way um it, they become kind of obsessed with their standing mm -hmm. now again that fits in developmentally eight-year-olds can be moody little yeah. guys mm -hmm. um but social media and technology and gaming have fed this. Okay. That's really interesting. Do mm -hmm. you, do you, I, I know you're not a one size fits all kind of parent coach. So how do you coach parents to approach that gaming and social media and technology use in their own homes? Is it, is it through like what works best for them? Do you have certain, are, and also feel free if you have resources on your site or something that speaks to this, we'll definitely can link those up in the show notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I can send you a whole bunch of people. If your child is on technology, um, an iPhone or an iPad, you have to assume they're seeing porn. So that should stop parents right there mm -hmm. about, should I be giving that over? Now, what you're going to say is, well, I have bark, I have guards, I have that stuff. Um, kids hack everything. Mm -hmm. Everything is hackable. And we are always the last to know. Right. Okay. Done and done. So you have to decide for each child in, in your home who can handle what. Mm -hmm. So if your kid has any executive functioning stuff, push it off as long as you physically can. Because the addictiveness is so much more extreme. Mm -hmm. Right? And as long as you can wait, wait. Because all you're doing is letting time do its work on the maturation process. Yeah. The older a kid is when they drink, use drugs, uh, game, uh, it, all the fun stuff. Right. <laughs> that can also ruin your life. Right, right. right. The older they are, the greater chance they have at managing it healthfully. Yeah. Is that a word? Yeah. Healthfully? Yeah. Healthfully. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah, I, I used to be an English teacher. Yeah. You can tell. <laughs> so um, I know that tech turned into a babysitter for parents at, a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And I know it became crucial during the pandemic. And I don't fault any of us for any of that. Right. Um, we are at the beginning of an, of an invention we don't understand. A lot of us did not grow up this way. We don't know what they're doing. Experts that tell you what to do are lying. They don't know either. Mm -hmm. um, the American like Pediatric Association. All the, I mean, nobody knows. Right. Nobody knows. But what we do know, <laughs> right? We know how the brain matures-ish. We know that um, kids being bored is good. Yep. We know that sunlight and movement are good. Yeah. So um, I can, yeah, I can email yeah. you some people um, who have excellent books and ideas. And, you know, the number one thing is I, I don't live afraid. Mm. Right. There's no fear. I don't live afraid. I don't. Um, it is going to be part of their lives. Right. It is now in the same pot of like sugar and right. all these things. Like this is the future. Here's where we are. Right. It's fun. like, let's work with it. The time we're living in. Yeah. Right. I love which that. is then I tell my nine year old about porn. Right. Which yeah. breaks your heart. Yeah. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So we are going to take another quick break, Megan, and I want to talk about your book when we come back. We are welcoming back Haya Kids Vitamins as a sponsor for today's episode. 
Megan, these daily multivitamins are such an improvement on the old chewables, many of which had as much as two teaspoons of added sugar, plus a bunch of chemicals and other stuff. Yeah, Haya has totally reimagined the kids' daily multivitamins, Sarah. They're made with zero sugar and zero gummy junk in a great taste that kids love. Haya vitamins start with a blend of 12 farm fresh fruits and vegetables, and then they're supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals known to help support a healthy immune system, energy levels, brain function, mood, teeth, bones, and more. Haya vitamins are also vegan, dairy-free, allergy-free, gelatin-free, and nut-free. They ship right to your door on a pediatrician-recommended schedule, and the packaging is both adorable and earth-conscious. Your kids will love it, too. And we have an amazing deal for you, 50% off. Just go to HayaHealth.com slash MomHour or enter the code MomHour at checkout to save 50% off your first order. That's H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash MomHour or use the code MomHour and you'll see the full discount applied at checkout. We are welcoming back our sponsor, Shopkick. Shopkick is the fun and easy way to score free gift cards for the shopping you already do. Shopkick has its own reward points. They're called Kicks. You just download their app and then you can earn kicks for doing really easy things like walking into a store, scanning items with your phone camera, and of course, making purchases. It really is just like a game, only at the end of this game, you're rewarded with real life rewards. After earning your kicks, you can cash them in for gift cards to stores like Target, Starbucks, and Groupon. There's actually a list of more than 40 stores to choose from for your reward gift cards. Sarah, I downloaded Shopkick and it has been so fun seeing what kind of kicks are available for me. I already worked the CVS extra buck system pretty hard. So I was really excited to see that CVS is one of the participating retailers because then it's like double rewards. I can use Shopkick at my local grocery store too, which is kind of cool. Most Shopkickers can earn enough kicks to get a gift card in a single week, which is definitely motivating me. You can also earn kicks by shopping online. So it's a fun way to earn no matter where you do your shopping. Since most of us will be doing more shopping than normal over the next couple of months, this is a great time to download the Shopkick app, give it a try, and see what kind of rewards you rack up. Download the Shopkick app today and use the code THEMOMHOUR to get your first $5 gift card for free. That's 5 bucks free just for trying it out. Again, download the Shopkick app and use the code THEMOMHOUR to get your first $5 gift card for free. All right, Megan, let's talk about your book, which you published kind of mid-pandemic or fairly recently. So tell everybody about the book and about kind of what it's about and, and all of that. So it's called Parenting Outside the Lines, Forget the Rules, Tap into Your Wisdom, and Connect with Your Child. Um, it was a horrendous process. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, when's your next book? I'm like, cool, never. Never. Um, no, it was... It, Listen, it was really great to be able to just say what I wanted. Um, and I, I wanted the book. First of all, nobody really does anything when they read a parenting book. So it's, it's like reading a book about exercise. You never get out of bed and like start doing stomach crunches. Right. You're like, right. yeah, good idea. And then you like <laughs> eat an Oreo and watch Housewives. So Nobody really reads a lot of parenting books and make a lot of changes. Um, there are uh, some glaring exceptions like Dr. Green's work, The Explosive Child, that certain books really can be life changing. The rest of them are just doorstops. <laughs> and um, I, I wanted the book to just not make parents feel worse. Yeah. Which is not lofty. But important. Um, <laughs> but important. I wanted them to feel um, like they understood their kid a teeny bit better mm -hmm. and could maintain empathy for both, right? Um, right? For the child and the parent. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to write about what was important to me, right? Um, so, you know, I have a chapter about the power of apologizing or... Um, I have a chapter about, uh, you know, expectations. Yeah. How we just ruin ourselves with our expectations. Um, and uh, I wanted people to laugh a little. Yeah. Because I'm not a very serious person. Um, that's, what, yeah. that's what drew me to your work, honestly, was the ability to laugh while also talking about important stuff. 
Does the book, um, does it go into ages and stages the way we've done in this uh, conversation today? Or is it kind of, does it work for anybody at any stage of parenting? I would, ch- I would say it skews younger. Mm-hmm. Um, that's when parents buy more parenting books. If you're a parent, <laughs> but it's true, you're, right? Because no, you're, you're right. I'm- right. If you're buying a parenting book for a tween or a teen, there's something specific wrong. Um, so like ADHD, eating sure. disorders, things like that. Um, general parenting books are for parents of younger kids. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, you know, so I just hope that the book, if like, you know, your friend is like, oh, I read this book. It's like not garbage. And like they pass over my book. They're like, oh, thanks. You know, like, great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Again, it's the meh. It's the I hope you have a meh day. I hope. Yeah. You, I hope. Right. I hope you enjoy this book that didn't make me feel like crap. Yeah, that's right. Or send you on a wild goose chase. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, um, I want you to stop, you know, torturing yourself with great dinners. I want you to stop, you know, um, complex consequence plans. I want you to stop beating yourself up because your kid cries. Yeah. At the yeah. piano recital. Like, you know, I, I want you to stop and I want you to understand why it's OK. Right. Yeah. And not even OK, but like good. Right. Well, and you you do kind of take on this perfectionism culture that we started talking about at the very beginning, this do, do, do culture head on in your book. And I I realized I didn't ask you if that was something that you had to face in your own parenting journey early on um, or if you just kind of came hardwired to resist that pressure. Mm, No, parenting will always find your buttons. Oh, I love that. Yeah. You, you will not be immune. So I, I was a natural born parent. I really didn't have any aspirations to be anything else. I did not have like a a successful like childhood and I didn't come out of high school, like ready to take on the world. I was pretty lost, but I, what I'm a good natural mother Mm -hmm. and a nurturer. Um, It just, as soon as they were out of being babies, I was like, oh, I can't control them. Yeah. Um, So that's where it showed up for me as control. So you'll see a lot of my work um, talks about control and the, the, the fallacy of control. What a joke. Um, And, and so in that way, perfectionism showed up and anxiety showed up um, in, in controlling. Yeah. Even if the control was couched in positivity. Right. Or, right. It's really, um, like we're used to old school control. Sure. Right. Like threats of violence and things like that. But there's an insidious, um, I'm doing this to help us. I'm doing this to connect. Right. I'm doing this. And, but the river that runs under it, is change be better, change be better, yeah. change be better. Yeah. 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 I relate to that a lot personally. Um, and you now with the ages of your kids, um, do you find yourself kind of, again, giving, give like coaching yourself, r- reminding and reframing some of these principles for yourself? Or do you just feel like you are swimming in the waters of, you know, learning as you go with teenagers? Both. Both. Yeah. Yeah, my um, my 14 year old's only academic teacher. (laughs) So we say she goes to summer camp, right? So she is her class is built into the first semester, second semester of the year. And she has art, uh, digital something or other, (laughs) choir and history. All right. She has four classes a day and then she's on the ultimate Frisbee team. So I'm like, how's camp? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cause she's just like singing and doing art and then a little bit of history. So, um, which is great, but also <laughs> this winter is going to be rough. Yeah. So yeah. her only academic teacher is leaving. Oh, okay. yeah. Brand new. Uh, I guess he took a coaching job somewhere. Okay. So immediately I'm like, well, this will not do. This will not do. <laughs> so, you know, I'm going to move her to another school. I'm going to, right. Right. I'm going to. And, you know, the beauty is if you raise your kids, (laughs) you know, so I was like, well, what should we do? And Louise just looked at me like, well, 
you know, nothing. Uh-huh. Like, them's the breaks. I'm like, but what about history? She's like, I don't actually care about history. And I was like, oh, well, but we have to care about everything. Yeah. You know, you're just going to have this sub. And um, so, yeah. So I, am I like fine with all of it? No. Right. But I'm like, okay, why don't we see what happens today? Right. Oh, my gosh. The right. power in that phrase. Why don't we wait and see what happens today, this week? Yeah. Right. And I wrote to the, the head of ninth grade, the whatever, I don't know. And it was like, do we have a plan? Of course they don't have a plan. <laughs> right. But, you know, I'm going to stay on top of it. But, you know, old, old Megan would have been making wild decisions based on fear. Sure. Yes. Um, I will say the beauty of parenting is that um, you get very beaten down. <laughs> you, <laughs> you are tired with a capital T. Yeah. So if you, you know, if you pay attention to yourself and keep your awareness about your parenting, um, really, it's the first seven years. <laughs> yeah. If you just keep showing up, Right. If you just keep attending to the needs that are in front of you and not making stories about the past or the future, Mm. if you keep showing up with empathy and love and some problem solving and boundaries, you can put your feet up. Right. Mm -hmm. You can be like, you know what? You got this. And sometimes they don't got it. Right. But the consequences will not lay them low. Yeah. Yeah. They'll survive. I love that. And so will you. Yeah. I love that. That's a very hopeful place to wrap up, which we have to do soon. Megan, I would love for you to tell everybody what's a great entry point to your work. Well, we'll tell everybody to buy the book and we'll link that up in the show notes. Is there another platform or a place or a course or a place on your website that's like, I want more of this? Uh, Where would you send people? Okay, so ML Parent Coach has everything you need. ML is a Megan Leahy Parent Coach. Um, I have all my Washington Post columns there, although please subscribe because, you know, we get paid. Yes. um, To the Post. (laughs) Um, I have a Washington Post live chat every other week where you can go on and ask questions anonymously, Mm -hmm. right? I have one this Wednesday. Uh, You can purchase my book anywhere books are sold. The coaching is on there. I have online classes. Everything is up on that website and um, yeah, easy. Well, that's where we will send everybody. And I know we went a little long today, but I was just kind of hanging on your every word. So thank you for spending this time with our audience and for talking with me. um, And we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. 